All right, hello. We've had a nail biter here. Up until one second ago, our guest was uh, unavailable. His, his computer was acting up. He was blaming malware. It was it was like it was so exciting. It yeah. was dramatic. It was dramatic, Jason. Jason, I'm starting to think you organized the whole thing just to elevate the drama. Exactly. That's true. Yeah, it was really like I, I yeah yeah I was actually I was playing uh, solitaire on my phone. <laughs> waiting to click the, uh, yeah yeah. <laughs> anyway, welcome to How to Win Webinar number 14. Uh, this one's called Learn from Hollywood. So uh, for those of you new to our webinar, um, every single week now we're going to a monthly schedule. We've been trying to introduce basic principles of creative activism, um, stepping out of the sort of small groups that we usually work with and speaking to a wider audience. We've had a great series of guests on. Um, we had Patricia Gerrito to talk about popular culture. We had two comrades from South Africa, Ishtar and Marlies, to talk about what it's like to work with a narcissistic authoritarian president. <laughs> um, and today we have our special guest, Jason Grote, to talk to us about what we can learn from Hollywood. Oh, by the way, I'm Steve Duncan. And I'm Steve Lambert. Yeah. And this is Hollywood Jay. Hollywood <laughs> Jay. And um, I'm going to give you all backstory on Jason. Uh, so Jason is a, a successful screenwriter. Um, he is, his credits include Mad Men and Smash. Um, but he's also, and he's also right now working on a screenplay with another friend of ours, um, John Johnson. Um, but he also has a previous career to that, um, and actually a continuing career as a playwright. Uh, he did an amazing adaptation of A Thousand One Nights. It wasn't really an adaptation. It was like a complete mind fuck, you know, hallucinogenic political take on a thousand one nights. Um, but how I got to know Jason was way, way back in the day um, as an organizer, as a community activist, um, and when we were both in the Lower East Side Collective together. Um, so anyway, Jason, thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. I have, to, I have to say, I know Jason as a caller to the best show on WFMU. Oh, yes. really? That's how. That's how oh. we got. <laughs> wow. I'm sort of like a marginal counterculture zealot. Like I'm always yeah. you know, popping up. If there is anything that's kind of weird or has a cult following, I'm somewhere there in the background. And, yeah. and now you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, we wanted to have you because of your expertise in uh, in story and narrative and stuff like that. You've also you were a professor, sort of, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've I've taught like you know adjunct and guest professoring, and then I was a, uh, you know, uh, contract faculty at Rutgers. One of these sort of ways that academia exploits us, you know, is that um, I was full time, which was great. You know, there there it was uh, a sort of half measure. You know, I, I had a full time salary and health insurance, and uh, but I was not tenure track. I was not going to be eligible for tenure at Rutgers. And then uh, you know there are budget cuts, and then I no longer had those things. Uh, so then you decamped to sunny Los Angeles. Yes, well, in between was Smash. So I, I you know, uh, motivated by desperation, you know, I, I just started. Um, you know, w one of the things about the job that I had was it was a little bit of a sinecure. You know, and here's this is some, you know, very kind of uh, brutal, like libertarian capitalist logic, which, uh, you know, I don't believe uh, ideologically, but I, I lived a version of it to some degree. Um, was that I just uh, had to go out of my comfort zone, you know, by this. It was, you know, I lost my health insurance. It was the Great Recession. My son had just been born. And so I wound up reaching out to everyone that I knew, you know, and this was um, in academia and in theater and in television and any kind of, of work that I could get. And uh, right, uh, I had taken a tenure track job in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the University of New Mexico. I really didn't want to move oh, really? to Albuquerque. I love New Mexico. Albuquerque is uh, great. Yeah, yeah, it is, but I didn't want to live there. You know, I, I you know. Um, it's like my uh, dream job. What's that? My dream job. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, um, it had. Uh, there were things about. There were great things about it, but there were also things. It was like, you know, it was a underfunded, you know, state school in a in a kind of poor state. There are a lot of things about it that you know. And also, the kind of work that I do is basically there are three cities that I can live in, which is uh, in the United States at least, which is like New York, Los Angeles, or Chicago. You know, there wasn't a lot. I would have. If I had moved to Albuquerque, I would have had to leave Albuquerque most of the time to do, you know, my creative work. Um, and then right uh, as that had happened, 
uh, I got a, a call from Teresa Reback that the show Smash was happening. She's a playwright and a creator of that show. And sort of saved my bacon. I got to stay in New York for one more year. Um, that turned out to be a fairly volatile experience. Teresa, you know, has spoken very publicly about that, about the, the way that she was uh, treated. So I'll uh, sort of send people to her account. You can, uh, you know, Google it. It was just an Entertainment Weekly. Um, but I was collateral damage to that. Uh, you know, there was a, a kind of push there, as often happens in TV. Uh, and I found myself at sea again, but in a much better position. I was now in the Writers Guild. Um, I had had my first credit um, and a little bit saved up. And then I came out for a week of meetings and had no, I like that. Uh, sorry, sorry, wrong image. I was trying to get the uh, smash thing up. That. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was like, "Oh, is this a is that commentary on my story?" Uh, <laughs> but uh, I wound up, um, you know, coming out for, and this is the sort of thing I had no uh, frame of reference for knowing how what a, a crazy fluke this was. But uh, I came out for a week of meetings and wound up getting a job on Mad Men, um, which was, you know, kind of unheard of. So that was uh, a kind of. Uh, a very furious and intense uh, single season, and uh, you know I wound up out on the street again with my bindle, uh, looking for another staffing job. And now, you know, since then I, I've sort of, uh, you know, more or less settled into the life of a middle class writer. I mean, there's still all those freelancer anxieties. You know, in fact, um, I've been writing a lot and uh, I'm submitting pieces all over about the uh, possible impending writer strike, which I can talk about today if that becomes relevant. Um, oh, wow. It's, it's a convergence of like the stuff that you guys are talking about and the actual life of my labor union. Um, so I, I've been, you know, actually pitching, trying to get op-eds and, you know, I've been pitching to the New York Times and Jacobin and wherever I, I can talk about this, uh, the issues relating to the strike, because there are a lot of misconceptions and I'm sure there'll be a big misinformation campaign if it comes to that. So well, you're... So you're like doing politics and screenwriting kind of at the same time. Yeah, well, you know, it's a little bit of, I mean, there is always a political element to what I write. I mean, I, I believe that all narrative is political, just as all politics are narrative. Um, and, uh, you know, but I have not, you know, being a parent and being a full-time working artist, that hasn't been such a prominent part of my life. Um, you know, other than, you know, the, the fallout from the election, going to the big women's march and things like that with my family. Um, but this is all of a sudden, um, the, a, a strike authorization vote is pending in the month of April. Uh, negotiations are still going on and I, uh, very reluctantly, I was, uh, you know, not really recruited so much, but, you know, I was asked uh, if I would be what's called a contract captain. It's sort of like, uh, you know, a pre-strike captain. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm sort of a reluctant recruit to this, but. You know, I, I think I have experience uh, organizing and activi with, with activism, and I have an understanding of the issues. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a little tricky. I think that uh, part of the job is just reaching out to other writers, not all of whom have the same interests. There are a lot of writers yeah. that I know that are very anti-strike authorization. Um, and basically, you know, part of the job there is just trying to hear people out, you know, like, like, like a good organizer. You know, you can't, uh, it's hard to get really, you know, angry with people when you're trying to convince them. And uh, also uh, try to convince them that, the, that actually the best way to avoid a strike, if that's what people don't want, is to uh, authorize the, the committee to strike, because that will give them more leverage in negotiations. And that's a very counterintuitive idea. Um, and it's a, it's a and then, you know, and it's, it's very arcane. You know, a lot of this is just sort of uh, deal making. And, you know, the studios have, are, are very, very good at finding loopholes, like ways to underpay writers. Um, you know, so there are guild minimums. It's a great middle class job, and of course there are superstars that are making tons of money. But you know, most of us are not. The image of most Hollywood writers is you know uh, something akin to like Dalton Trumbo in the the recent movie with Brian Cranston, which is that we're a bunch of really rich communists, you know, sitting by a pool, you know, talking about Marx as we're swilling martinis. And actually, you know, it's a it's, it's a it's a middle class job. I mean, I think that the the compensation's good when you're working. I mean, I think that it's a, you know, it's a fun job. I really love it, but um, there is, we're, we're workers, you know, and we're dealing with management and they're, they're sort of trying to squeeze every penny they can out of us. Well, I, well, I hope you're not. drinking, uh, I hope you're drinking beer and uh, reading Marx at least. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want that life for you. I want you to be by the pool talking about Marx and sipping drinks. So I, hope I would love it. Believe me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So where, where this um, came from, uh, Jason is uh, 
we were working with Greenpeace um, about a month and a half ago, and we were drinking beers and talking marks um, uh, one day, and um, uh, one evening, and we started talking about the idea of Donald Trump sort of changing the paradigm of politics. Mm -hmm. um, that there'd been other politicians who borrowed from entertainment, most notoriously Adolf Hitler, you know, taking acting lessons, um, but even people like John F. Kennedy and his very groomed appearance on television, Eisenhower hiring an advertising firm to do his first um, uh, political campaign, or Ronald Reagan, you know, who is a genuine, bona fide, if B-grade actor. But all of them, more or less, were borrowing from entertainment to do a performance as a politician. And we're like, Donald Trump is doing something else. He's like an entertainer who just happens to be using the stage of politics. Mm -hmm. And so then we started thinking, like, you know, we've got to defeat him differently, right? We've got to think about this whole strategy differently, that it's not the way that we necessarily would go about defeating a politician. Instead, we need to think like someone who's going to kill a show. <laughs> and we were like, okay, so who knows a lot about what makes a hit show and what makes a show a bomb? And we're like, Jason Grote. we got to ask Jason Grote. And so that's where it came from, the impetus to have you on here. And so what we want to do is just pick your brain to the beginning before we even talk about politics, right? But just talk about, like, why does a show die? Mm -hmm. uh, because if we can figure that out, maybe we can kill the Trump show. Like, <laughs> what kills the show? What, when do fans get upset and dump it? Um, like, what are the things, you know, we had this whole idea about, you know, jumping the shark, okay? Um, and Steve's going to put up some slides here. You know, the famous moment when Happy Days, you know, I think God knows what season it was in. You know, they put in a storyline of Fonzie going out to Hollywood and jumping over a shark, okay? And at that moment, it became so ludicrous, so ridiculous, that it's become sort of parlance to talk about when a show goes too far outside its norm, right? So what are the other sort of jump the shark sort of indicators um, out there that we can think about and we might be able to apply to the Trump show? Does that make sense as a question? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the, the key thing, and this is no guarantee of success at all, but I think that, um, you know, know what your show is. You know, I think that the, the, the things, and, you know, and I've been on, uh, there is no one size fits all. I mean, I've been on a show, um, Smash would be one example, where Teresa actually did have a very clear creative vision and she wanted to, to move forward with it, but she fell victims to politics. Um, and then, you know, I was on a show um, that had, uh, I won't name it, but, uh, you know, it, it had outlived its, uh, the, the, what little vision the creator had at the beginning, and he didn't have much to start out with. But um, it wound up being, um, you know, for whatever mysterious reason, I mean, my, my uh, pet, my conspiracy theory about it is that the studio executives were uh, double dipping, they were paying themselves as producers. And so they had a vested interest in keeping it on the air as long as possible. Um, but uh, so I think that, uh, but I think that show was a creative disaster. And I think that, you know, it, it survived despite the fact that nobody really watched it. Um, so I think that the, the, and then obviously, you know, with the credit of Mad Men, I mean, that's an example of a show that persevered, that uh, was, you know, not that many people watched it at first, but it managed to get great critical acclaim and awards nominations and then sort of uh, emerged out and then became, you know, this very massively watched show by the and very massively talked about show by the final season uh, or seasons. Um, and that's a show that has always had a very clear and steady uh, and courageous artistic vision where the showrunner of that did not veer, you know, like kind of. Uh, and so um, I know, you know, you wanted to talk about this in the context of TV, but I think it's, it's kind of a uh, the metaphors are, are very simple. I mean, I think that, you know, Trump is very good. He has he knows what his vision is, uh, you know, that, as an entertainer. Um, and he is always to that. I, th I think that, that that's also, you know, if you read the kind of uh, mainstream or liberal commentary at, and they're talking about how inconsistent he is about like, oh, they, you know, in 2013 or whatever year it was, he was uh, saying that Obama should stay out of Syria, to use a current example. That's the wrong kind of consistency that people are focusing on. I think that it's his consistency as an entertainer, this like idea of 
you know, this politics of a, of grievance um, that, that he kind of brings to the fore and it's like, I'm going to rile up, I'm going to, you know, you hate the establishment, I hate the establishment, I'm going to shake them up. Um, and he's also the example of the showrunner that gets fired. I think that, you know, that, that um, you know, if he, met, if he somehow got impeached and Pence became uh, president, I think it would be probably be something similar to the fate of Smash, where the a showrunner, um, you know, had a vi had a vision, fell victim to politics, and was replaced with a with a you know a yes man that would do whatever the executive said, but had no vision of his own, and then the show gets canceled after an additional season. Um, Can you say more about like why uh -huh. wh why would a showrunner get fired? Like, what's the situation that leads to that? It's always politics, uh, you know. When a showrunner gets fired, it's usually, um, and it's a very delicate, you know, um, uh, thing to, you know, it, it, the 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 meat the meter of how much you can get away with pushing back against executives, in some cases abusing the executives. Um, it's all based on clout, you know, and how much you have and how the show, and you know, even then there are people, you know, um, I mean, Aaron Sorkin was famously fired from The West Wing from this hit show. Um, that that uh, there is no guarantee. I mean, I think that, that but very often, if they have, if, if you are making the executives a lot of money um, and helping them have some job security, uh, you can get away with a lot more than if, you know, everyone has to kind of be good. And it's like, you know, the, the general uh, rule of thumb is you sort of nod your head courteously and thank the executives for their insight and take some of their notes, but not all of them, because if you take all of them, uh, they will see how bad their ideas are and blame you for them, um, or they will uh, see you as having no vision. So it's a it's a very tricky thing, but it's almost always uh, you know um, you know uh, uh, unless it's something like uh, that that the executive producer is just just can't run a show and um, and they can't hire somebody to help them. Usually that's what they'll do first is like they'll bring in somebody more ex experienced. So if the showrunner is clearly just driving the show off a cliff or has an addiction problem or, you know, it just doesn't know how to do it and it's, it's causing delays, delays in production, you know, cost something like a half a million dollars a day. Um, you can't delay production. That will get you fired. Um, so that's the, you know, I think they, um, and I think, the, again, the metaphor extends to like, you know, Trump can get away with saying whatever he wants, but if he gets, if, if he interferes too much with the military industrial complex or with Wall Street, they will turn on it. You know, I think that that's, um, and then the other metaphor for the, which I feel like is the Mad Men example is a politician. And, you know, of course, like the history hasn't been written yet, it remains to be seen. But I think that, um, you know, Bernie Sanders is the example of the, the, the prestige TV show um, that, you know, nobody, it starts out, nobody's watching it. And then gradually, like word of mouth builds and it's like the wire, you know, now, you know, everybody's watching Bernie on DVD, like after he's off the air, you know. Um, I think that he's the kind of, you know, and because he, again, he's somebody who knows it. And that's why we have this, I think that people tend not to understand why a lot of Trump voters also like Bernie. It's the, the, because what they appreciate is the consistency. Whereas I think that, and sometimes, you know, you'll have somebody like an Obama or a Cory Booker, who I feel like is the network show, is CSI. Somebody that, you know, is like a lot of stuff you've seen before, is the inspired version of the, the sort of the tired old, you know, um, formulaic program. Um, and I think that, you know, um, you know, uh, sadly, you know, uh, Hillary, who I voted for, is an example of somebody that it's the network procedural that's like it's following the law and order model or CSI or, or big event, whatever, whatever kind of hit that you want to that is like a lot of other hits. But it's sort of lacking that little spark, that thing that makes it unique, the thing that, you know, um, and those are the shows that tend to, you know, they maybe chug along for a year or two and they go off the air. So I think that that's. Um, you know, um, and I feel like, unfortunately, that's, you know, we've talked about, like, the crisis of mainstream liberalism. That's kind of where it's at. It's a sort of, like, it's, you know, the, the, the season where you have, like, hundreds of CSI knockoffs that, you know, nobody's watching the way they watch CSI. Um, you know. This makes sense, because it's, like, Trump, does, the, a lot of people describe him as breaking the formula, right? Like, he's not acting like a traditional politician, which is part of his appeal part of the frustration um but it it's it's like uh you know when prior to reality tv when reality tv comes along it's like oh wow what's this and he is the reality tv politician you know mm -hmm. yeah i think in a lot of ways we were kind of primed ideologically for this i mean i think that that 
you know, um, I, I, I kind of like the sort of um, cosmopolitan bourgeois reality TV shows like Project Runway and Top Chef and all those. Um, that, but I think that the the really popular ones, the Survivors and and you know Big Brother and The Bachelor, like there, there is, and a lot, I'm not the first person to, to like talk about this. Uh, it's been written about extensively, but there is kind of this really savage ideology behind it. I think that you know if you look at it, like we've got sort of you know 20 years of sort of priming the country intentionally or not, uh, you know, but for. Uh, for a Trump, I feel like he's this monster that we've created. I mean, he, you know, obviously he's even got his own reality show, but uh, this this Mark Burnett vision of the world where, um, you know, I'm not here to be liked, I'm here to win. Like creating a kind of hero, um, you know, that that's, uh, and in some ways, you know, Trump is that anti-hero. I mean, I think that uh, he, he, you know, it, it's the same thing about, you um, you know, when you've got your Walter White or Don Draper or Tony Soprano, and they're uh, they're behaving terribly, uh, constantly, and then they do that one nice thing, or they're kind to a child. It's like the the Hollywood term for it is pat the dog, um, and then all of a sudden you just love that person. I think that Trump gets that. I think that every once in a while he'll make sense or he'll show some flash of decency, and that's his pat the dog moment. And and there's something about that that we're so, uh, you know. That, that those kinds of anti-heroes are so compelling. You can't take your eyes off them. And they're so revolting. And like, when's it going to stop? And then you get the sense of relief. And it's, it's sort of like, a, you know, the, um, the, 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 you know, some sort of Stockholm syndrome or domestic abuse where you're like, oh, he really loves me. You know, and then so you get that. And that's the, the emotional dynamic that's happening on a lot of these TV shows with anti-heroes. Do you see it? I'm wondering what those Pat the Dog moments have been. Because, like, that part he doesn't seem, actually seem to be very good at. No, but there are, um, I mean, the, the, there was something during the campaign that I thought of where he sort of, but, uh, so to give an example, the, the speech he gave, I just heard a snippet on it on the radio in the car, um, where he just talks about, like, um, the the victims of the chemical weapons in, yeah. uh, in Syria, baby. you know, and he's talking about babies, you know, he's got this sort of baby, you hear it in his voice, and, you know, and it's like, I know what a con man he is, and I, and but it's also like, I was also affected by watching that tragedy, and, and I know that, you know, Trump is sort of this, you know, um, all it, I mean, that, that's the strange thing about it. I mean, you know, um, unlike, uh, you know, a Reagan or uh, more of the people that Reagan surrounded himself with, saying the same with Bush, it's sort of like the, the, those guys were sort of cynically using right wing media, but they had their own agenda on the side. It was very like Leo Strauss way of doing things. Whereas the like Trump is a mutation of that because he's like actually watching the stuff and buying it. And so, the second, I thought I was like, I could buy the fact that he actually just watched that and he's having a gut reaction to it. Yeah. Um, and so, and in that moment, even though I know, even though I'm uh, cerebrally, I'm separated from that. I'm not going to fall for it. I feel it. Like it, uh, it did work on me emotionally, even though I knew not to fall for it. Um, and there, there are other moments like that. I think, you know, during the campaign, there was even something that came out about the internal war uh, between Steve Bannon and, and Jared Kushner and, how uh, Bannon calls Kushner a Democrat. And it's this moment of kind of like, oh, maybe there is, you know, it's like, and it's such a low threshold. I think mm -hmm. it's just the fact that he is such a heel, you know, it's the other, like a, like a heel in pro wrestling, which is something he's also been involved with. It's very much that thing of like, you watch the heel suddenly come in on the side of the hero because he's got his own agenda. And he's hitting, he's hitting the worst bad guy with a chair. And you're like, and there's something about that that makes you really invested in it. So I think that, um, I, I, and again, I think this is all entirely a performer's instinct. I don't think he's smart enough, really, to have calculated all this. I think he just kind of goes by gut. Um, but I do think that there, the fact that he is so rarely kind or decent is part of the, that strategy. You know, is that, that it's almost like it's so scarce that when it comes, it's like, it's, it's this. You know, and, and I feel like that's something, you know, that is absolutely true. Uh, you know, in a writer's room, you know, we talk about that with antiheroes all the time. It's like how do you you know you kind of keep that moment you you know and any kind of moment where you want the audience to feel good or feel you know you want to hold that you want to delay that as long as possible so that it's got this like a uh, you know it really lands it's really effective when it does happen. So Jason, uh, this actually does a lot to explain why he's been so successful, but of course what we want to do is take him down. We want yeah. to kill the show. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things you said about killing the show is when they don't please the executives and you know we can substitute in wall street military industrial complex republican establishment and so on and so forth 
But it also strikes me is that there's a time when fans turn on a show. Mm -hmm. And what causes fans to actually, and if we think about democracy, is, you know, the fans are the people, right? Mm -hmm. And so what causes the fans to turn on a show? Um, well, I think it's the show not living up to what you, like, what they're, you know, what, what they're invested in. I mean, I think that there is, um, you know, part of the, the Trump recipe is that he's dealing with a fickle public and he's been very effective at reinventing, reinventing himself, but it is also, it's sort of like, where do you go after president? You know, is that like, um, you know, he, he is sort of the, the man about town, New York real estate developer and all the tabloids. And then, you know, he's the comeback kid and then he's the reality star. And now he's the, then he's the right wing pundit and then he's the president. You know, I think that, um, but it, it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, and he's also 70, so I don't know how many uh, reinventions he would have left. But I think part of that we're starting to see already. And I think that a part of this is, uh, you know, one thing that I worry about is, is that, um, you know, whether it's the, the, the Democratic Party or just sort of like the, uh, you know, online progressives or the, the movement in the streets, is that are we going to be ready for when this inevitable moment happens? Because the people that the fans that are going to turn on him are not necessarily people that we're going to want in our coalition. I mean, we could take advantage of that. So there's a couple of different ways of looking. Like you said, there's the political establishment, but the, the fans themselves are already seeing it with these like MAGA guys, you know, these kind of online creeps that are populating Twitter and Reddit and YouTube that are already, they're mad about internet privacy stuff. Like, you know, presumably because they have a lot to lose. Um, they, I'm sure that they have some terrible things in their browser history. Um, and but they're, they're mad about the invasion of Syria, which it's like, um, in that respect, I agree with them. Um, so there's, there's that fan base, which is sort of the ugly online extreme right. Um, and that was only a matter of time because they do that to, to everybody. I mean, I think that this is the, the Tea Party eats its own. Its own. Um, and that, I have my own thoughts about that because that's also, you know, it's, I think that, that that's almost designed, you know, to kind of, they can sort of chew up and spit out Paul Ryan and let us find another guy to, to push the agenda for it. Um, and then the, the other part of it is, which I think here is the part that I think there is a real opportunity, are the fans that, um, you know, the people uh, that um, are, that actually really thought that uh, he was going to bring manufacturing back. That, um, and, and, and this is a little tricky, because I think that it's, it's, it's sometimes not the easiest thing for people to hear because of all of our, the way that it's reported and all these associations, but I do think that you know, um, I think the shocking thing about, about all this was like Trump winning the, the Rust Belt. Um, and, you know, you look at these places and uh, I, I think uh, they, they've been devastated. I mean, I think that this is just the way that the economy has been moving for 40 or 50 years of the wealth coming to the cities, manufacturing leaving the country. Now, you know, we've got an opioid epidemic. And so it's basically, I think what's happening to a lot of rural areas uh, is very similar to what happened in inner cities in the 80s and 90s with the crack academic, epidemic and so on. Um, and that's been really hard for a lot of people. And I think that they saw his willingness to blow things up. They saw his kind of brand of paleoconservative, like things are going to be great, make America great again. I and mean, that's a really effective slogan. That's the way that, that um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it's something you can put on a hat. Um, and I think people are starting to realize that, that he's like, you know, um, there's obviously the cases of, um, you know, people, the, for example, I just read about the, the, the wife who voted for Trump and her husband got deported. A lot of people have, you know, it's sort of, most people don't pay attention to politics as closely as, uh, you know, the three of us do, for example. Um, and so they're, they're just sort of going by, they watch a little bit on TV and they're, they're like believing this and voting for it. And they're finding out that it was a con, of course, um, that, that, that it's just kind of brutalized. And I think that, um, and there's an opportunity to um, turn people against that. And I think that, you know, part of the trap here is that I think a lot of people, especially you know, um, women and people of color and LGBT people, are so uh, upset, understandably, about the bigotry surrounding Trump's campaign. And they're mad at a lot of those voters. Um, and I think that, that there is, I understand that anger and I, I, I respect part of it. And I think that even if those people pulling that, that ballot, like we're not, um, active and excited, you know, they, they may not have been actively racist themselves. They're at least kind of indifferent to the terrible things that Trump was saying, and that's something they should be accountable for. 
but I also think that's not it's not a winning strategy. I think it's like you know it, it's being able to uh, you know put that aside and sort of do outreach and reach out to people and and sort of you know have a little forgiveness. It's like maybe not satisfying and and you know it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of like what's effective. And I think this is again gets back to television because it's all about you know reaching the the widest audience audience possible. You're not sort of going for some platonic idea. You're trying to get invited into people's living rooms or, you know, on that now on the laptop sitting on their stomach, on their bed. You know, it's very intimate. You want to let, you know, it's very different from movies, in fact. It's like, that's a different, that's a more spectacular experience. Like, and so I think that, um, you know, wanting to, to sort of um, get in there. And, and so, um, you know, and I do think that a big part of why this is so thorny is that, when uh, mainstream, when like the New York Times or CNN is writing about this, they're writing about the white working class, um, which is not necessarily right. I feel like it's, it sort of really divides things in a way that isn't necessary. Because I think that, you know, there was some Edison poll that I read that uh, um, a majority of Trump's coalition, I, I can't attest to the accuracy of this, but it was a legitimate poll that said a majority of his coalition was women and people of color. Um, so I, I think that... Um, you know, when you're uh, talking about how the working class in rural states has been affected, that does include, yes, like the working class uh, is overwhelmingly female and does contain a lot of people of color in it. And I think that, um, you know, having the conversation about it in that way that doesn't focus on the whiteness of the working class, but rather on the broadness in general and uh, uh, the way that we reach people. Um, and, and then there's the thing, you know, I mean, uh, Frank Rich, who I respect as a, as a kind of cultural critic and as the producer of Veep, a show that I like a lot, wrote this really, I thought, um, horrendous article about being like about how, you know, I forget West Virginia or Kentucky or whatever could go fuck themselves, um, like as they starve to death. Um, and I think that that's, that's a terrible attitude. I feel like that that's um, something that I find uh, reprehensible from a moral standpoint, but also like totally a losing strategy. Like who is going to want to support like some, you know, very wealthy elite New Yorker who is saying that somebody's like children or elderly parents should die because their state voted 50.1% for Donald Trump. You know, I think that that's a losing strategy. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's the challenge. I think that it's sort of like being ready with a better show when those viewers turn off the Donald Trump show. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. What's the better show? You laid out the Democratic Party as you know, CSI number 17 set in Cleveland or yeah. something like that, right? Or Vancouver. I mean, yeah. it's just, yeah, it's, who's going to watch that? Yeah. What's the better show? Um, you know, I, I think that there's, I don't think Bernie is a perfect candidate by any means. And I think that there, um, I, I do sort of take the cult of personality around him with a grain of salt, but I think that there's something about, you know, um, the sort of crusty, funny old grandpa. I feel like it's no coincidence that Larry David played him on Saturday Night Live. Like, you know, but but somebody that that is, um, you know, that is courageous and willing to sort of they're willing to speak to people. I mean, I think that that's like, um, you know, and then there's there's a, there's a, a huge temptation uh, to be elite. I mean, I I think that, you know, sometimes I I look at people, at colleagues that I work with or work for who um, have no frame of reference outside of television and, uh, you know, uh, hardly see even movies, like don't go to see theater or art, don't read books really. Um, and, uh, you know, they're just sort of holed up in some, you know, house in, in Santa Monica or the Hollywood Hills, you know, and, and uh, you know, don't, aren't that interested in engaging. And uh, I got to say, there's something nice about that life. You know, I think that that's, uh, but that's the, the life that leads you to do the CSI number 17. You're sort of, you know, you're, you're, um, and I think that that's the bubble. The bubble is, is uh, you know, and, and there are lots of incentives to, to live that life. And it's a much easier life. And I think the harder life is to go with the premium cable show and to, you know, to do the thing that nobody else is doing to kind of get out there um, outside of one's own comfort zone. Um, and so, um, again, I'm not the first person to say this, but I think it's sort of like getting out and finding out what people want. Like, let's, you know, um, I mean, that, that I think was one of the more disappointing things about Hillary's 2016 campaign is that, um, you know, again, the Clintons have always been problematic for me and for anybody on the left. But uh, one thing that I admired in 2000 was that she went upstate and did that listening tour and whether she meant it or not, it was effective and it worked and it won her the seat. Um, and I was like, why didn't she do that now? Like why, like, you know, she could have done that. I think that, that, um, and I think that, 
you know, it's not going to be easy, but I think kind of sloughing off this sort of uh, these barnacles of consultants and, you know, uh, pundits and whomever that are you know, like in this kind of beltway mentality, like I think it, like sloughing off that conventional wisdom. Um, I think that's also like how Obama managed to win. I think that he, um, he, he was uh, an establishment candidate in so many ways and he didn't try to you know, change the system from the outside. But he also knew when not to listen. You know, he also knew how to get out there and that um, he, he believed that he could be uh, a black man and go to the middle of Iowa, you know, that, that he and convince people to vote for him. Um, and I think that's, you know, um, you know, sometimes I feel like the left can learn so much from so, a figure like Tony Robbins. You know, this is something that, uh, you know, um, I, 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 uh, I, I've talked to actually about this with my shrink, you know, it's sort of like that, that kind of gung-ho self-help thing. It's so, uh, it's so out of vogue on the left. I mean, I think Barbara Ehrenreich has even written a book about what a fraud it is. And, you know, it is this sort of, and it's got all these negative associations, but being in Hollywood, this place where I'm constantly like, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's emotionally very brutal, you know, you're facing constant rejection, but you can't give up hope because if you give up hope, you're just dead in the water. Um, and so uh, it's a survival street. You know, you have to figure out a way to get out there and keep pitching and just keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep believing in what you're doing uh, um, in a place where it seems like nobody else does. Um, and then also that heartbreak. I mean, cynicism protects us, you know, is that if I go out there, if I go into a pitch thinking that I already have no stand a snowball's chance in hell, I will not sell that pitch. I will already have failed in advance, uh, but I'll, I won't feel bad. You know, I won't feel worse, I should say. I'll go in feeling bad and I'll go out feeling the same amount of bad as opposed to going in and being like, I believe in this, I love it, I want to make it into a show. And then you're heartbroken. You know, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out a way to, to, to manage that. Um, and I think that's sort of the trap that, like, uh, that the left or progressives have gotten themselves into. And I think that, um, you know, uh, and so getting back to why I brought my shrink into this, I was talking about how conflicted I was. And on the one hand, you know, I'm, I'm like listening to Tony Robbins' audiobooks. I'm, I'm that cliche that independent films make fun of, driving around Los Angeles, listening to a self-help book, you know. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the things that she brought up, you know, my, my um, shrink grew up in L.A. as a red diaper baby, um, is that, you know, uh, this, uh, that, that in her experience, the most successful organizers and activists that she knew were positive thinkers themselves. That it's not just this sort of flim flammery, and that it's also, um, you know, just like I, I, I need to go into a pitch really believing in my show, you know, to organize, you really need to believe in your cause, you know, you really need to believe in your argument and to actually believe that you will change things, yeah. um, or that you can change things, there's the potential to change things, and figuring out a way to protect yourself when those failures inevitably happen, because that's part of... Uh, you know, it's part of the arts, it's part of a life in the arts, and it's part of organizing, um, that it's going to happen. You know, there will be tons of failure. Um, That's great. Um, I, did, I wanted to say two things. One, uh, if you have questions for Jason, just like type them in and we will relay them to him. Um, the other thing was, you, you said a few times, you know, like really good shows aren't popular in the beginning. Which, That's not universally true, um, you know. But so there are exa many examples of great shows that are there because somebody had faith in them. Um, you know, and th th this is the other thing. It's funny. Um, you know, I posted excuse me, a long Facebook post about how um, I was becoming a contract captain for the Writers Guild, announcing if people want, you know, if they have questions, they can come to me, that sort of thing. And, you know, as a, as a joke, um, a friend of mine, uh, an online friend who is a, a kind of a leftist, uh, like an academic, uh, makes uh, studio executives afraid again. And, uh, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, gently set him straight that the studio executives aren't the enemy, that very often they are the ones, um, especially in these days, when there are a million different channels, that the, the, they're the ones that are keeping a show alive because they believe in it, even though yeah. hardly anybody is watching it. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are examples of great shows that don't get a following and fail. I think that... Um, you know, now that we're in the days, and a lot of it is a sort of long tail thing of like niche marketing, um, that, that it's like you, you, a small dedicated audience often is just as good as a, a large casual audience. Um, and so, but I think that it's, it's like um, remaining true to this artistic vision and holding out. And, and I think that having faith 
um, that somebody somewhere will look out for it. Um, that it's not just a, like a numbers game. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so I, I think that, uh, you know, and that's, I think, that, you know, the Bernie metaphor of somebody that kind of came at, you know, the, the, the mayor of Burlington who now is on the national stage and now pushing forward Medicare for all. And you can have this, you know, conventional beltway wisdom of like, you know, and, and it, it's sort of like, you know, H Hillary being on tape being like, you know, single payer healthcare would never, ever happen. It's like, that's not the kind of thing you say if you want to win a campaign, you know, even if you're against it. it it's like if you, if you contrast it with Obama. Sure. You know, he was much more savvy about it and said that, you know, uh, if we were starting over, you know, and I don't agree with his argument, but at least he was saying like, oh, yes, I believe with, I, I agree with you. But given the parameters, here's how we're going to do it. You know, that's the way that he framed the whole thing. Um, well, I think that idea that you, that great things aren't always popular in the beginning, you need to hang in there, it can be really encouraging. But the other thing you said that sort of, uh, it can also like, excuse us from trying to get really uh, popular, right? Yeah. Like you said, in the end, you want viewers, you want to be in their homes. And mm -hmm. so saying like, well, my show is great, that's why no one's watching it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have you know, this great movement, it's just too far avant-garde, too far ahead of mm -hmm. anyone. Decades later, they're gonna understand what I was doing. But that gives us permission to not engage in, in you know, reaching a majority of, of people. Um, so what do you think about that? And then we have some questions from people that I can relay to you. Um, I don't think that's something that actually exists in Hollywood. I feel like that's a little bit of a, you know, that, that's sort of a myth that comes down to, you know, movies like Sullivan's Travels or Barton Fink, you know, of the, um, that there are, in reality, there are so many hurdles before you even manage to uh, get a show on the air that they're, um, those lone geniuses are, you know, uh, you, you don't have the equivalent of like the, you know, the, uh, the, the tanky selling, you know, revolutionary newspapers in every March, you know, it's like, I think that, that it, it's, in that respect, it's a lot more like electoral politics. Like first you have to convince people to work with you and then you have to convince the donors and then you have to, whatever, you know, it's like you have to, by the time you actually get to the place where you're having a show on the air, you have already had to convince so many people of your artistic vision that it doesn't allow that luxury that you can't, you know, it's, it's like, you, you may see that, um, you know, uh, to some degree, uh, you know, you might see that in independent film, I think, you know, I think that, that, that it's still possible to make a movie, um, you know, that, that, uh, that can be really obscure, but you have to do all that yourself. You know, I mean, you're still convincing actors and, you know, figuring out how to, how to do it, you know, even if you're not getting financing. Um, so uh, I, I think baked into the process is you, you are trying to, uh, you know, you're, you're basically following more or less the, the accumulated rules of compelling storytelling. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the framework around it is, um, it's a lot less about like, oh, this is going to be, I mean, there, there is, there are categories. It's like there are cable shows and broadcast shows and everyone is aware of that. And you're sort of respecting what genre you're writing and people that write cop procedurals are people that come out of that world and, and are fluent in it. Um, and they know the formula and then people on cable shows are uh, responding to a vision, but everyone knows, you, don't, you don't, sort of don't get that far without knowing like, well, you need characters that you want, that you, you have to watch and you have and relationships that you need to, uh, that, that are going to be super compelling that, that, you know, um, you know, Jesse and Walter on Breaking Bad. It's like, I want to sit like I, these two guys, they, this is a compelling relationship that I want to follow. You need a strong story. You need, and, and you feel it out. I mean, it's not, um, you know, again, by the time you've been in more than one writer's room, you, you know, you have a gut sense of like, this is boring or this is interesting. And, you know, and it, it's not, you know, um, one of the things that uh, Matthew Weiner on Mad Men would always say, because he's, you know, his show was seen as this, like, you know, Chekhov or Richard Ford, this very highly literary, very non-TV TV show. And he always used to remind us, the writers, and anybody that would, uh, that would ask him, like, I'm in the entertainment business. You know, that's what he would always come back to, is that, like, um, ultimately, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, not about 
uh, alienating people. It's about, and I think that that's a little bit of a different thing because I think that there's the um, there's the too cool for school left that doesn't want to you know sort of uh, reach out to like the normie crowd. Um, yeah. And then and then there's the different thing, which I think is really important, which is like um, I'm not going to compromise my show, but I'm going to get my show that I love and care about and believe in to the widest audience possible, right. which is different. So that, that right. and I think that there's, yeah, that's the best of both worlds because I think that that's like, so it's like, I want Medicare for all. I'm not going to back down on Medicare for all, but I want, you know, the whole country wants Medicare for all. Um, and I'm going to use that to move the levers of power. Um, yeah. And I think that's the, you know, um, and I think, you know, it's, it's sort of like what Chomsky says, poll after poll after poll says that the, the public when asked outside of context is, is, on our side, but I think that it's the it's the elites and the machinery that don't want it, and it's also what Chomsky doesn't acknowledge is that it's culture. I think that people, you know, they might if you ask them if they want Medicare for all, they'll say yes, and then they watch watch Fox News and get like sort of wrapped up in some outrage, and don't want to be associated with it. It becomes this feeling, um, and, and I think a lot of what you're you're saying about uh, not wanting to reach people it's become a national malaise you know. it's like our national disorder. It's not just people on the left. It's like everybody wants to, uh, you know, and it's this bubble thing too of social media. It's like, you know, they want to differentiate themselves so much that like everybody has got their own little tiny group and doesn't want to reach out to other people. Um, which I think is, is a problem. Sorry. Great, great question too. Okay, sure. So you mentioned character and there was uh, Melanie had a good question that related to that and I just wanted to steer you towards it. So um, she said people have said that because of character assassination, Hillary never had a chance. Do you think character assassination by husband, which I, I think I'm, that makes sense, is a kind of winning Hollywood storyline? Story line? Was there a kind of change, uh, chance to change that narrative if we had been thinking more like Hollywood or more or caught that narrative and been able to work with it? And I'm going to add another another question on top of that because I think they both speak to this idea of storyline. Um, and this is also: is, Do you think the way the resistance is being presented and talked about in media and pop culture could follow one of these storylines? Mm -hmm. And if so, how could we, as opponents to Trump's agenda, not become easy to ignore, dismiss as light or co-opted, or so on and so forth? Are there narrative threads to develop that can strengthen the work? Well, I mean, I think in both cases, it's like you got to deliver. You know, it's like I feel like that this is um, the you know it's going to be the thing that sort of like if anything uh, sinks Trump in the end, it'll be that it'll be the, his inability to deliver on the. Uh, and I think the things that he's like, and by that I, I don't mean building a wall in Mexico. I think that he could maybe deliver on that, maybe not. But I think that uh, you know, it's like if he does do that, and people realize that it's not going to fix their lives. You know, I think that that what he's not going to deliver on is the promise of his narrative. Um, yeah. And so I think that um, my fears for the resistance and uh, my, my, I think the, the, the failures of, of Hillary Clinton, it's partially a failure of narrative and also a failure of, of delivery. So I think that there is a part, um, like I think that what Trump did was sort of like he, he was confronted with all this, like he was you know publicly caught on tape bragging about sexual assault. He was clearly like smoking gun, you know, associated with all these horrible things. And he, what he did was not let that stop him. He sort of waved it away and he's like, forget me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a bad guy, but I'm the bad guy that's going to give you what you want. Um, and I think that um, in the case of Hillary there, and, and it's, it's why it's, it's a bit mysterious to me because I think there are examples that I remember when she used the narrative to her advantage very effectively. Um, you know, and one of them is the, um, around the time that she ran for the Senate seat, uh, that she, uh, the narrative of her was, you know, she was the good wife. That was the inspiration for the show, The Good Wife. That it was somebody that you liked because they were married to this cat, and maybe you hated Bill, but you know what? Like she was okay, you know. And I think that, and the more the right wing would attack her, the more that you liked her. And in some, you know, way, and you could maybe blame Obama for this. You could maybe blame Bernie for this, but the narrative shifted, you know, and she, and it, it, she was no longer that, that character. She instead was the sort of, she was the, the steady hand on the tiller. You know, she was the, um, the, the, the person that was going to protect the status quo. And I think that that was the fatal error because I think that the, the totally underestimated how many people hated the status quo. Um, so that was partially a narrative thing, but then also it's, it's like, 
it's a matter of, of delivering. And I think that the right has understood this really effectively is that, um, you know, it was worth sacrificing a couple of Senate seats in, um, you know, uh, 2010 or whatever year it was when all those Tea Party maniacs were running is that uh, it looked like they lost in the short term, but really they, they won because uh, they were willing to say that they stood for something. And then all they had to do is like find a candidate that maybe, you know, um, hadn't practiced witchcraft or whatever, you know, like, like somebody that didn't have something kind of too kooky uh, in their closet. Um, and I think that what I worry about with the, the resistance, I think it's great to you know, getting all these people out on the streets that are experiencing firsthand with a state of civil liberties in our country. Like, I think that, uh, you know, and, and, and of seeing like how great it is to experience democracy in public and talk to people and relate to people and realize that you can be part of a coalition where you don't have to in, in agree on every single thing with people but you can throw in for a common cause and actually have a conversation. Um, I think that's, you know, that's my hope for the resistance. My, um, you know, my, my fear about it is, is the lack of delivery. Is it that it's really about that the resistance is going to sit on their hands now um, that, you know, that, that uh, Trump is bombing Syria because that's something that a lot of Democrats want. Like, um, you know, I, I don't know that that's a, you know, I feel like that's, Something I've actually, you know, on the in my social media world, uh, because I'm in the arts and entertainment as well as in left politics, I think that that's something I've seen like leftists worry about a lot more than I've seen liberals actually do it. And I think I, you know, I, I um, a lot of the the big, you know, I'm with her kind of uh, Clinton fans that I see in social media are are also worried about um, the uh, the escalation of a war with or, or, or war with Syria. Um, so I feel like that, that that's uh, that's the trick is that um, it, it's got to be delivering. You know, I think think that that's and that, that you know maybe there is a metaphor you could say that a good story has to deliver, or you can just also acknowledge that you know entertainment and politics differ from each other in this way. Politics is expected sometimes to produce tangible results. Um, that you know, whereas entertainment is it's a it's a sort of closed system. So you think so, in the end, Jason that actually, even though he might be writing as an entertainer, the fact is he's in a political office mm -hmm. and that the reality of politics is sooner or later you want someone to deliver a job to your community. Sooner or later yeah. you want to have a good school to send your kid to. And that the whole sort of entertainment module, which works on TV because there's no stakes, yeah. actually may fall apart yeah. because of this delivery. I think so. I think that that is the sort of like the, the place. And I think that, um, and that is going to be the trick. Like, I think that um, if he gets a second term, it'll be less because he wins and more because whatever, the, whatever Democratic candidate loses. Uh, what's that? They can't pitch a good show. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's like, and so, um, you know, and then the, the worry about it is, because I, I do think that people will eventually wake up. I mean, I think that by, the middle of Bush's second term, I think people sort of came out of their 9-11 shock and were able to realize that Bush had, you know, was not a good president. Um, and my hope is that it, it's, it happens, you know, um, in two years or four years instead of six or eight years uh, that people start to come out of this. Because I think that, the uh, you know, um, I honestly think that, uh, you know, and, and we can't forget, I think that, that Hillary Clinton won a three million vote majority. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, we have to kind of be, also be realistic about the rights institutional advantages, that they play the game a lot better, they cheat. Um, you know, I think that that's uh, something to be aware of and that it's, it's and I feel like the, a big error uh, that Clinton made that Obama didn't was just looking at the demographics and saying like, oh, well, you know, that we're, we're getting, you know, women and people of color and LGBT people are becoming a majority in this country, attitudes are shifting, and, but not realizing that, that none of that matters if, the, if, if those people don't get out and vote. Um, and again, that's, you know, people not coming out is like people not watching your show. Um, you know, it's sort of like it can, you know, uh, you have to figure out a way to, to convince people to devote some of their valuable time to this thing that you've made. Um, and, it's, uh, and you have to respect that. You know, it's like, it's, it's, yeah. it's you know, um, That's it's not, I feel like that people that are like angry at people that didn't go out and vote, it's sort of like, okay, if that makes you feel better, but it's not, you can't blame the voters. You have to, you know, it's like you can't, you can get mad at the viewers for not watching your show, um, but it's not going to save your show. 
that was a great. That, note, uh, yeah. that was great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we got we got to end, Steve. Yeah, we're we're out of time, but um, there were some other good questions, so maybe we can figure out a way to do a, a follow up. Um, so we'll figure that out. But I just wanted to mention really quick, and uh, Rebecca, maybe you can help me with this. We've got um, in about a month. Uh, our next webinar, which is about making the news. So like how you get press, how you approach um, the media in a way that uh, they're going to be, they're going to understand what your story is and, um, and get you more likely to get that story in the paper or on TV. Um, and the, the registration link is in the chat. The other thing we have going is, um, Around a month from now, too, we're doing an online webinar and an in-person workshop linked up together with Creative Capital here in New York City. And um, Rebecca just posted the link for that. So if it's something you want to do, you can look into it. Um, Jason, I just want to say thanks again. Jason, uh, it's so great having you here. No, that's and, great. Uh, you're looking healthy. You're looking good. Thanks, you guys, too. Yeah, I miss you both. I hope I get to see you in real life soon. Yeah, yeah well. well well, I'll be by the pool drinking uh, uh, drinks and, and getting in the sun in L.A., right? Yeah, I'll help you guys out. You can, you know. And talk at Mark's. Yeah. All right, cool. I'll see you later. Good, right. luck with the, good luck with the strike, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed. Okay. All right, take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Right. See you later.